Welcome to the Inferno Cast. Today I got one of my great friends, Jimmy Pedro, who's an Olympian judo player, and he's also a lifelong martial artist and a very successful entrepreneur. How are you doing today, Jimmy? I'm doing great, Caleb. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Always a pleasure to see you, brother. Man, for sure. I, uh, I just want to talk to you today about some of your history and your story coming up and just your experiences with martial arts. So I wanted to just jump to the beginning. So a lot of people, I, I wonder if they don't realize that, you know, your dad was also a big time judo player and, and he was uh, an alternate for the Olympics, right? Yep. My yeah. dad, my dad started judo a little bit older in life. He started when he was 19. Um, just drove down the street, sense. saw the sign that said karate judo, walked in the door, started taking lessons, fell in love with, you know, martial arts and the fact that, you know, you can get as good as you want. You don't have to play, you know, it doesn't matter who the coach is, doesn't matter politics, doesn't matter what type of athlete you are, you get to participate. So that's why he loved it. He loved fighting. He loved everything that judo had to bring. And, um, you know, he, he started a little later, so it was hard for him to technically get real good, but he yeah. became a very good student of the game. He was just one of those guys that just put a lot of time in the weight room, got super strong, fought all as much as possible, went everywhere he could to get better. And then uh, in 1976, he tried out for the Olympic team. He fell a little bit short. And then ever since I was a little boy, he groomed me to, like, think about the Olympics, representing the country, and uh, made it my dream from a, from a young age. So patriotism was kind of, like, ingrained in you, you know, as a young kid, as far as, like, thinking outside of just, like, your household, you know? I mean, if your dad's thinking on a world level, competing in, in, in judo, thinking about the Olympics – you know, so you you were probably raised up with a very large perspective of the world as your playground versus just like, this is our neighborhood, this is where we live, you go to work, you come home. Correct. He, uh, yeah. from, from the, I remember watching the 1976 Olympics, Montreal Olympics on TV with my dad. I was five years old at the time. And just what it was bit back then, it was Bruce Jenner, right? And I watched all the superstars uh, win and compete in those games. And I remember him telling me, you know, Jimmy, the, the two greatest things you can do for your country are number one, you know, represent fighting the army, you know, rep fighting and represent and protect citizens of America. So being patriotic and being American and, and fighting in war, that's number one. And number two is the Olympic Games. He said, those are the two things, the greatest things you can do for your country. And so I was ingrained since five. And I was yeah, sold. That's all you need. I was sold an Olympic dream then. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm guessing like you guys probably just martial arts was probably like so normal to you that you didn't even look at it as an activity. It was just what you did. It's like going to school. It's my way of life. It was yeah. since I was two. I went to the dojo since I was two years old. Every night from 3 p.m. till 9 p.m. I was at the dojo. My dad ran classes, you know, from three to nine. And we had a weight room inside there. And my, you know, from the age of like six, I had to do like little circuit training before classes. He had me do a 30 minute circuit, push ups, sit ups, you know, dips, yeah. all this Uchikomi bands, all that stuff. And then I had my judo practice three nights a week at the time that I had to participate in. It was Monday, Wednesday, and actually Saturday mornings. So That's since awesome. the age of five, it was every day. There was no option. I knew I could go out and play after school for a short period of time. But then my mom was going to some days take me at five. I could play with my friends, but I had to be on the mat at six for judo. And there was no way I wasn't there unless I was playing another sport or I had, you know, a lot of homework to do as I got older. Yeah. Was there ever times where you can remember as a kid kind of, don't really feel like going to class, rather try something else. I want to try something new. Like, you know, did you go through that kind of burnout phase as a kid and give your parents some resistance? Everybody does. To tell you otherwise would be different. Think about it, right? Summertime, Massachusetts, 90 or 100 degrees. You're playing outside. I lived on a lake when I was a kid. So I had in my backyard was a playground, right? We had a little, yeah. we lived in a really poor city, Lynn, Massachusetts. But we had a lake in our backyard. We had a, an old boat. So I could go like water skiing, fishing with my friends, all that stuff. So all summer, I'm out on the lake all day getting sunburned and swimming for 12 hours, whatever it was. And then all of a sudden, 5 o'clock would roll around and mom would go, hey, you got to get in the car. We got to go judo. And my dad's judo club was old school. It was on the third floor of, a, of an industrial building with a tin oh, wow. roof on it and no AC, no heat in the winter, no AC in the summer. It was like 110 degree sweat box. And after playing outside all day and running around with my friends, here I am sweating your butt off before you even walk on the mat. And my dad's practices were always militaristic. It was train yeah. as hard as you can. When he says go, you better be moving. He had the old bamboo stick back in the day. 
And if you goofed off with the stick, grind, grind, grind. To say the least, it wasn't. Discipline was there, but training was hardcore and it was hard. So, of course, there were times I didn't want to go. No, oh, absolutely. You know, but, you know, it sounds like a, you know, and that's a story you still see with kids today that are doing martial arts where like there's those ups and downs. They want to do different things, but kind of adhering to the structure and, you know, these are the goals. This is just, it just becomes the norm. So at what age do you feel like you transition into where, you know, you were motivated by your parents, but then at some stage you probably found your drive as an athlete. There's all like, no, this is what I do. This is what defines me you know, and it's my identity and I'm, I'm going to go to the Olympics. Like, was there a time or a moment or you, you felt that pivot that it was like the fire inside? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, like I said, I did judo since I was a little kid and it wasn't an option for me. Like <clears throat> most parents are like, well, did you give your kid the choice or didn't you give him a choice? My dad didn't give me a choice. He said, you're doing judo period. I don't care. So you're 18 years old. You're going to do judo. It's good for you physically, mentally. I know it's going to help you out in life. So I was made to do judo. And had I been given the option not to do it, especially to, to compete, I would have chosen not to compete. But my dad, too bad, you're fighting. I don't care, it's good for you. So I, I ended up getting used to it, I accepted it. I wasn't gonna win any battles with my dad ever. So judo became my life. But I really started like thinking about it as my, and I was undefeated for like, till I was 11, I never lost a contest. And then I was national champion from six till I was 14. 14 years old was the first time I didn't place in a national championship event. Um, so for me, losses didn't come very often and they were devastating when they did. But I think when I really became my own man and this is my identity and this is a sport that I love and I really, really see that I have the potential to be good was when I was about 15 years old. And that's when I, I started to mature. You know, I hit puberty at that age. I was a late bloomer. I hit puberty at 15. I started becoming a man and become more physical. And that was the time where I really started dedicating myself 100% to actually trying to become a, an Olympian. So whenever you started thinking about becoming an Olympian, the mindset was you knew this was possible. You knew it was capable. Was there a time in which it was just like chiseled in stone where you're like, I'm going, this is already done versus the, I'm going to try to make this happen. Was, was there a transition there or was that moment one in the same where it was like, 15 years old, I've found my solidarity of myself and I'm going to be in the Olympics? Or did that come later where it became very real? Well, I said I didn't place in, the, in, in the, my first national championship when I was 14. So that was a time where I was playing baseball. I was playing football. I was doing judo. I took a lot of time away from judo during that time. I was a kid who didn't mature yet. So that was an age where they were mature and I wasn't, and I was playing a lot of other sports. So it was just a, a pivotal time in my life. And when I lost that nationals, it was, Hey man, if you really want to do judo, it's got to be hundred percent full time, decide what sport you're going to play and go forward. As a little kid, you could play many sports, but as you start to get that age, you got to become a professional and more serious. So 15 years old, I dedicated myself 14 to 15. Everything was judo. All other sports went away. And at that point, um, my 15 year old national championship title, I beat, I grew like 30 pounds that year. I fought a lot of good guys from all over the country. I beat them all at the national championships. That was a time where I had dedicated myself and I had beaten the best again. And then I knew right there, like my, this is my sport. I am destined to go to the games. And we, my dad just started sending me every place in the country. I could go to get better every camp, every clinic, uh, every tournament. We started chasing it then. And even at 16, I was competing with guys that had medaled in the Olympics. You know, I, I, I was head to head with them. I didn't beat them, but I lost by a referee's decision. I was competitive in every match. That's when I knew, man, these guys won Olympic medals. You're barely losing. You're 16 years old. Man, I got a shot at this thing. Yeah. So. Well, so whenever you went to the Olympic trials, mm -hmm. whenever you made it, what did that look like at home with, with you and your family? You know, was it just like, yep, we knew this was coming. Was it the, you know, the moment is here. You know, what did the, what was that like? Uh, amazing. It was, it was, so the first Olympic trials for me was in uh, 1992. It was in Colorado Springs. It was at the Olympic training center. Uh, the top at the time, the best eight guys in the country got invited to the Olympic trials and I had an eight man bracket. 
and the winner of the if you were number one seed going into the trials and you won then you're on the olympic team if you were number one and you lost then there was a best two out of three with whoever beat you so that was this trial system i went into the olympic trials ranked number one um ranked number one at 143 pounds the number two guy was on the 88 olympic team he was he had made the team in 88 so it was him and i and he was somebody that lived and trained in japan and I only competed against him like one or two times before that event. So yeah, he was, I had won once, he had won once, and here we are fighting in the Olympic trials. But it, it was no guarantee I was going to make the team. Nobody from my dojo had ever made the Olympics before. So my dad was a very accomplished instructor, right? And we had a great junior national team. We had people that had represented uh, the United States at world level competitions, but we had never had an Olympian homegrown. So for me, my entire club, family, everybody flew to Colorado to watch me fight in the trials. And I won my first match. And then in the finals against the guy from, um, you know, from Japan, his name was Joe Marshall. He, it was him and I, and realistically, I was just amped up, ready to go. And I, I, in the first minute, first minute, I remember coming across an Osoto Gari. We had, he had one hand on the gi, I had one hand on the gi. He was near the edge. He let up like a moment lapse on his part. I came across on Osoto and I blasted him free palm. And I made the team and it was a one minute fight. It was one of the easiest fights of my life, but it was the best and most, most exhilarating fight of my life. I was excited beyond belief. And I had become the first Olympian ever from Jimmy Pedro's Judo Center, the dynasty that we ended up, that started at that moment in 92. And since 92, we've put so many Olympians on the, on the, on the team. When you think about, you know, Ronda Rousey, Kayla Harrison, Travis Stevens, kids like Ch Taraji Williams, Murray, uh, Alex Odiano, you like we've got a, a stable of like 10, 12 Olympians that we've created from the school, but it, I was the very first one in 92. And ever since then, then it became medals and more medals. And, but that's when sort of the dynasty was created in that moment. I'll never forget because I hugged my dad and it was one of the first times in my life I'd ever seen tears come to my dad's eyes. He's a guy who's like stoic. You know, he's the army general. He's the guy who's in charge of everything, takes no bull crap. And uh, to see the tears come down his eyes was, was just so memorable. One of the great moments, right? That's awesome. awesome. So whenever that moment happened, you know, like you're going to the Olympics, this is it. I know that the focus probably turned inward of like, you got to get ready. You have to get prepared. But do you feel that the, the club and the team – knew that this was the start of something big you know like this was going to become the olympic hotbed for judo you know were you thinking like that or was it all just like we just got to get through the next victory we got to get prepared yeah i don't think they knew it was anything other than it was a lifelong commitment on my father's side who had run a club for 20 years he started his own dojo in 72 and i made the team in 92 so it was a 20-year journey of producing thousands and thousands of athletes to get to that moment of producing your one Olympia right after 20 years. Um, but it was just, for us, it was, I finally get to represent the country at the Olympic games. And now that was January of 20, January of 1992, the Olympics was July. So I had, you know, seven months to get ready. And back then everything was super organized. There was, you know, national coaching staff, boom, we got on a plane, we went to Europe, we started fighting in France, we did training camp then fought in Austria, then did a camp, went to Germany, stayed in Germany for a week, came home for two weeks, went on the road to Japan. Like we had the whole schedule planned, six months training for the Olympics, got to the Olympic games. And man, for me, it was, it was, it was the most amazing uh, atmosphere to be a part of, you know, that was when basketball had, was an Olympic sport and it was the dream team. And we sent yeah. Larry Bird and, you know, uh, Michael Jordan and everybody. I was on the same team as all those guys, man. I was a star. It was amazing. Yeah. So, and for me, the, the Olympics is like a, like a huge amusement park. You all these superstar athletes. Everything's free. You walk up and you take any, push a button, your Coca-Cola comes out, push a button, the water comes out, go to the calf 24 seven, eat whatever food you wanted to access the bicycles. It was on a beach. We're in Barcelona. It was heaven, you know, and the competition for me was so disappointing because it was, I didn't medal. You know, I, I, I was ranked third in the world at the time. Um, the Japanese guy that they sent 
was a different person that took a silver in the worlds the year before. So it was a guy who was unknown and he was, the Japanese was supposed to be in a separate bracket because it was a seated event. But because this guy replaced the other guy, he was randomly in the draw. He ended up, I ended up having to fight him in my third round. So early on in the competition. And back then there was no videos to watch. There was no way to look the guy up online to see what he did. It was just a blind, go out and fight the guy. You never seen him before, see what happens type of thing. And yeah. He was probably the one guy at that competition that day that I couldn't beat or didn't beat. Um, he caught me early in the match. He scored a Yuko. I came back. I dragged him around. He got three penalties. It just wasn't enough to win the fight. Um, and back then, he had to make it all the way to the finals or I was out of the tournament. And I had made him so tired in the fight with him that he couldn't even fight his next match. He couldn't stand up anymore. And he, he just – the Cuban guy just ran right over him because he was just exhausted. He kept, yeah. you know, taking injury timeouts and trying to catch his breath and just didn't happen. But at that Olympics, what was so disappointing is that the gold medalist from Brazil, I had beaten five times in my career, five and all. Oh. You know, the, the bronze medalist from Cuba, I never lost to. I was six and oh in my career against the Cubans. So it was one of those moments I was sitting up in the stands with my dad and I was just crying, watching the medalists take their medals and thinking to myself, that could have been me, should have been me. I did everything in my power to get there. I was, in my mind, the best judo player of that day. I just lost on a mistake against a, a, a Japanese guy I'd never seen before. And had I fought him before, I'd been able to study him at all, probably wouldn't have been so aggressive. I just, as I came high, he hit me with a, a sasai yeah. and knocked me down. It was enough for the win. And he held on for the win. It just was one of those things that I thought to myself, I, waste, I spent my whole life waiting for this moment, right? Talking 20, 20 years of sacrifice and you feel like, I don't care if I made an Olympics, everybody's like, oh, you made an Olympia, you're an Olympian. But my goal was to win. And when you come home with nothing, and I think about all the sacrifices, all those training sessions I went to when I didn't want to go, all the missed parties with my friends and going to the movies or hanging out, whatever it was, I felt like I lost and it, it didn't seem worth it. You know, at the time, that's how I felt yeah. in that moment. In the moment. Looking back, if you asked me to do it all over again, I'm in. I'm signing up. I'm doing it all over again. I'd make every sacrifice again. The experiences I've had in life and where I've got to go, the friends I've been able to make, 100% I'm in. But at yeah. that moment in time when you're watching the people and you didn't get a chance yourself yet to do that, that's when it was crushing. How did that moment change you as a person? It, that was, it was a tough time because I lost, but my friend, Jason Morris, took a silver medal, right? Yeah. And, but at that same Olympics, my friend's father had a heart attack and died. So at the Olympics in Barcelona, here I am. I'm a guy who sacrificed my life that didn't win a medal, but I got my family. Yeah. My dad behind me, my family still behind me. Jason made his dream come true. He wins, wins his silver medal. A week later, his dad passes away. His dad's his whole world. And I went and spent a couple of weeks with him afterwards. Just, we just hung out, man, because we traveled the world together. We were teammates. We were roommates. So it was a really tough time thinking about where do you put your priorities in life, family, you know, reaching your goals, all that stuff. It made me realize, like, winning a medal is not, not the end-all, be-all. It doesn't define friends. you. Right. You know, and it's the pro it, it, looking back as you're older, they always talk about the process, but really it's not the metal. The, the metal, okay, great, but it doesn't really put food on the table, right? It really doesn't. It opens a few doors, makes it a little easier, but you still got to have the work ethic, the integrity, the perseverance, the personality, the still got to have the drive and grind. And that's, those are the lessons that, that martial arts teaches that made me who I am, that make me successful today and have connections with people like you. Absolutely, right? man. And it's that interpersonal skills and we value each other's time and energy and what we've committed to. I don't care yeah. if you're a gold medalist or you're an Olympian or you were just pursued excellence. To me, it's yeah. the pursuit of excellence is what matters. And did you give 100% of yourself? And can you look yourself in the eye and say, did everything I could to reach my potential? Because that's success. To me. Yeah, because, you know, there's so many people that they're chasing these dreams because once they get there, then they will be happy. 
you know, but that's really not the reality of it. So the next Olympics, whenever you get to go, you make it to the podium. How did it feel? Is, you know, was it everything you thought it was going to be or was your value system a little shifted because you kind of had a better comprehension of what life was all about to where the medal was a compliment to your success instead of your success was the medal? How did that feel and affect you? Well, I felt amazing because, you know, I had the, I had a, in between those four years, I had had a disc injury in my neck. I got injured really bad. The doctor told me that I'd never play sports again. They want to make you a normal human being. Forget about judo. Forget about wrestling. You're done. You know, so that was in between 92 and 96. I had that incident and six months of doing nothing. Not, I couldn't, I couldn't move. I lost all size, all muscle function on the right side of my, my body. I was done. I mean, it was awful. But after nine months, I started to get better and stronger, and I could start participating and running and lifting and doing stuff again. And then I made a comeback for the, the 96 games. And I went two years. I took off from college. I went two years away. I just trained my butt off. And I ended up making it to the podium in Atlanta, in the United States, in front of all my family, all my friends, those same people that were at the trials. They couldn't come to Barcelona, but they, were, they all drove to Atlanta to watch me fight. And that was unbelievable, best experience of my life. You know, people chanting, USA, USA. Like, I was the only medalist from the United States in judo at that games. It was on home turf. I was a rock star afterwards walking around Atlanta with a medal. Like, listen, it was so rewarding. Was it gold? No. But it was a bronze medal, and it was as good as gold to me. Because it represented yeah. like, man, I made it. I didn't quit. I didn't feel sorry for myself. My life's work, it came to something and it was, it was a dream for me come true. So, but keep it in perspective, without people there who care about you, without like, the, what are you, who are you winning for and why are you winning? Because it was a team that got me there, you know? And, and it was gratifying to me to give back and show people, thanks for me, all the sacrifices all the training, all the times you pushed me in training, all the times you came when you didn't want to to support me, we did it together, you know, and it was, it was truly amazing. And that feeling was special. It's like, what good is the victory if there's nobody to share with, you know? It's like now, right? It's like now we're all sitting in our houses. What do we talk about? There's no new sports on TV. There's no new happenings in the world. What are you doing today? Nothing. What are you doing tomorrow? Nothing. Yeah. Right? It, really, you know, we've we got a close, close family that we're living with, but we can't see anybody. We can't interact. With it, we can't share anything with anybody. So it's kind of, there's no new happenings in the world other than negative bad news. So we have to talk about the stuff that we did in the past so yeah. we can feel positive and good and can't wait for the time we can do it in the future. But it's Which really is, about enjoying the moment. It's really enjoying those moments together. That's it. That, that's yeah. exactly it, man. I mean, it's like, that's the perspective that people miss out in life so much that, you know, I've always felt like martial arts kind of, you know, it can chisel that out of people where they can find that real value system of what really matters and, you know, and connecting with people and pouring into others and then pouring into you. And, and you've really done that, you know, as an athlete, because then you go to coach to where, you know, you're coaching Olympians regularly, you're pushing these people to their limits, getting them to be successful. Um, yeah, I know we're limited on time, so I just wanted to kind of finish up with just your perspective on coaching and leading others. You know, what do you demand of your athletes? If you could put it into one or two things of just like, I demand this out of an athlete because it is that important. One is, is, is the key to success is mental toughness. An athlete who is mentally tough and who will not be broken is the key to a successful champion. If you look at any, look at Tom Brady in football. Worst, on paper, he's the worst athlete that ever went to the NFL Combine. The one thing he has is mental fortitude. He believes he's as good as, he's the best ever and he's gonna prove it to anybody. So in his own mind, he's the best. And athletes that think they're invincible, that's number one. What I demand from the athlete is that they put 100% effort into everything they do. They give me the, they, they buy in and they commit 100%. If I, that's what I want, 100% commitment. So if you give me that, we can become champion as long as when push comes to shove, 
you're mentally tough and you don't think anybody's better than you. Man, and that's great advice that I, I really do think rings true with high level athletes. And, and you've taken that onto your, you know, into your entrepreneur, you know, system with like what you run in the, the Fuji business and what you've done professionally beyond the martial arts and what you invest in school owners, the products you make available and just the way that you've taken the, the martial artist and you've created a company that shares the values of a martial artist to where I think that's why you guys are really connecting, you know, in the martial arts community, because it, it is different. It's not just stuff like you, you can feel and see the connection of an athlete on the back end with a lot of these products, you know, because I mean, it just, it's something I've got to see over the last 10 to 12 years, you know, that we've kind of been around each other and been friends is like, you guys are really getting established in the marketplace as you know, the athletes go to because you're run by athletes. And I think honestly, it's your personal standard of being a high level athlete that is just kind of trickled over into it to where you're doing the same thing with your employees, your suppliers, the customer service, you know, you're demanding excellence out Correct. of everybody in your life, which that's I feel like key. that's the, the secret to success that, that, uh, that you've propagated is surround yourself with excellence, pursue perfection, and that is going to hit the crossroads of, of, of where you want to be in life. Um, anything you lastly not- you want to, you want to give us before you have to go? Thank you for noticing that. that it truly is, it, it is, it is very meaningful. And what I've created is a family. I tell everybody it's the Fuji family. I treat my employees like family. They treat me like, you know, a father, you know, and I treat them like my children. And I ask them for the same thing. I demand excellence. I ask for their loyalty, their support, and their commitment. I'm going to trust you that you're going to do your job. And if in doing so, I will keep, you know, keep you employed and keep growing and keep giving you more and keep giving you more responsibility so that we're all growing together and creating an amazing team, you know? And so that, that's all I would say is I love my guys. They, hopefully they feel the same about me. And um, I, I truly do appreciate all of their hard work because I couldn't be successful without all their commitment. Yeah. Well, awesome, man. I appreciate you taking time out of your day. I know things are a little bit crazy and busy with all this that's going on. Uh, thanks for taking a few moments to chat with me and we'll definitely be following you and keeping up with you and hopefully we'll talk soon. All right, brother. Thank you so much. Good luck to you.